There's a video gaming blogger named Vivek who needs special controllers in order to enjoy playing video games. Recently, he started modding his controllers using a product called Sugru. Sugru is the world's first moldable glue. It sticks to many materials like glass, ceramic, wood, metal, and most plastics. Once it's removed from the sealed pack, you have 30 minutes of working time to fix, build, and create whatever you need. After 24 hours, Sugru cures into a strong and durable silicone rubber. It's flexible and electrically insulating, making it perfect for these kinds of projects. The makers of Sugru reached out to see if I could help Vivek make the custom controller of his dreams. Of course I said yes! I'll be using Sugru for this project, along with all of my usual tools and a lot of elbow grease. Before we get started, let's listen to Vivek's story and learn more about his needs. The following segment was produced by the makers of Sugru at Vivek's home. Hi, I'm Vivek, and I'm 28, and I live with Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. Duchenne is just a, a muscle wasting condition, and that's genetic. So over the years, I've slowly deteriorated in my muscles. I'm like I, I stopped walking when I was nine, and now I um, can't move my arms or my legs, or kind of I have problems even speaking. I think for me, gaming is very important, because when I had to stop gaming, I realized how kind of depressed I was because that was a big form of my enjoyment because uh, it was escape. I, when I was playing, I just forgot about my body and just kind of enjoyed the experience because the experience is the most important thing for me. For my game controller setups, over, over the years, they've, I've gone through many iterations, many problems that are kind of try and find a solution myself, but a lot of the time now um, I'm running out of solutions so I'm kind of having to use uh, devices like Sugru to make changes in how, how I hold it. Uh, there's quite a few Xbox games that haven't been accessible but one of my favourite has been kind of Mass Effect. I couldn't really get um, like R2 button or kind of R1 on my PlayStation controller. So at the minute, I use quite a few switches, one on my head, so I can get around a problem with um, kind of pressing those buttons. There are a lot of issues with the buttons. I need special softer press buttons and also the shape of the face buttons. They're quite flat and I can't really press those buttons even though I've adapted them. So there are a lot of kind of awkward things that need changing, which is difficult kind of to figure out yourself. You need a lot more, I'd say, expertise. Okay, I did some collaboration with Sugru and Vivek, and this is the controller modification he would like me to attempt. So we're going to take a HoriPad FPS Plus Pro and use that as our base controller. It's a third-party PlayStation 4 controller. One big thing that he wants to do is um, change the face buttons. So we're going to take the triangle, square, X, circle, make them a little bit smaller and closer together. Same thing with the D-pad, make it more like the Nintendo Switch, where instead of a cross, you have four little buttons also closer together. Not sure how we're going to do that quite yet. Um, two analog sticks in the PlayStation configuration. The one on the left will have a little bit of a nub on the upper left corner. So we can probably form those caps out of Sugru. Down here, we want to have uh, two metallic things sticking out of the controller. These will be uh, touch sensitive controls. So instead of like doing the L3, R3 clicking into the stick, which takes a lot of force, you can just lightly tap either one of these rods. So we can probably use an integrated circuit for that. Then uh, up to four, um, one eighth inch headphone jacks, which are used for attaching external switches like the ones that you saw in the video. And then we'll also do some modifications to the shoulder buttons. And here's a side view of the same thing. Um, he wants little extensions on the face button, specifically triangle and circle. We'll probably add those last. You can see the touch sensitive rods here. 
and then on the L2 R2 extend them with Sugru so you have a bit of a lever function to them so it takes less pressure to actually make them fully go. And then another major feature is he wants to have a base and a stand on the controller so the controller can be kept at the proper height for him to hold with his hands but he actually won't be holding the controller with his hands. The controller will be at the correct height so his hands can just wrap around it so it requires less strength to use. So what I'll probably do is make it adjustable so the height and the tilt of the controller can be adjustable. That way he can set it up however he wants and then add whatever sort of padding or gel he desires onto the base. Okay, so that's the plan of attack. We're going to start by taking apart the controller. This is the Horipad FPS Plus. It's one of the very few third-party controllers for the PlayStation 4. You can usually get these off Amazon. Sometimes they're from uh, third-party sellers, you know. Um, but the problem is, standard PlayStation controllers use silkscreen for the circuits. It's very hard to mod. Whereas these don't. This is the silkscreen circuit from a PlayStation 3, I believe. They silkscreen, just like a t-shirt, conductive ink onto a piece of plastic. And the real problem is how it connects to the main motherboard. You have these um, exposed pads here, and those are pressure fit against the main PCB. So you can't really piggyback onto it because the only way to attach this existing cable is to compress it on, and that means you can't actually add wires on it either. Now the Hori is different. It just has a bog standard PCB that's easy to mod. Let's take a look. Okay, so this is nice. Look at how simple this is. And everything is very well labeled. See? It tells you exactly what everything is. So see what they did here is they put the analog sticks on their own PCB because the analog sticks are deeper than the buttons. One piece of counterintuitive advice is the best way to remove solder is to add solder. Basically it gives you um, more heat mass coming off the iron. I mean I can probably remove this without even using the solder iron. I just rake it back and forth, slowly pull it out just like that. Then I can use this solder wick. This is basically braided copper. The reason it's braided is so it has more surface area, which means it will suck up more solder. Here's a tip. When you're disassembling something like this, take the screws from each step and put them back into the posts. That way you don't lose them and you know where they came from. See this little ribbon cable right here? That's going to be the touchpad, the cool feature on PlayStation 4 that never got used. I mean, when a Metal Gear game doesn't use your touchpad for some sort of weird function, you know it's useless. There's a tack switch. Click, 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 click. That's for when you press in on it. And then this is an I squared C device, basically giving you the XY position of the touch. It's pretty rudimentary. If you look closely, this has the same carbon pads across the buttons as the PlayStation 3 controller did. That's because this thing has PlayStation 3 compatibility mode, which means um, you can have pressure sensitive buttons. So in the design, Vivek wants both of the analog sticks centered here. So make it like a PlayStation 4 controller. Although the Hori is oriented like an Xbox 360 controller. So I need to swap the D-pad and left analog stick positions. So we have this inner PCB, so basically I need to move the left analog right about there. I think I could probably just use a piece of perf board for this. Radio Shack Surplus Bakelite or a PCB. And usually these analog sticks map out pretty well to the 0.1 inch pitch. Some of them are a pretty good match, like the upper potentiometer here. The left potentiometer isn't really, so I'm just going to have to like carve out a small area, uh, area. But the four mounting points match up pretty good to a 0.1 inch pitch area, as does the Kalikian tack switch right there. Going to use a... 
1.5 millimeter bit for this. One issue sometimes that happens is if you drill from the opposite side of the pad, you'll lift up the pad on the other side. Doesn't seem like there was too much damage here though. Cool, now that I know that works, what I can do next is position the other analog so that it fits where the D-pad used to be. I can also copy over the screw mount positions so this new piece of perf board fits exactly where the old one was. Well, one of them lines up at least. Guess we don't need to go that far over since <laughs> that analog stick isn't going to be there. Cool. Took me a couple tries, but I have a Bakelite PCB cut out here. Use my bandsaw. Going to make sure it fits in the controller the way it should. And most importantly, make sure that the analog stick is centered nicely in the hole. <clears throat> Screw that in place. Okay. Analog stick looks pretty good. It's maybe a little bit too far to the left. I'm actually going to solder this analog into place just so it won't move around while I'm doing other things. Yeah, I'll lay this um, piece of snipped lead across it. And I can solder that to the legs and the pads and have a pretty solid connection. Yeah, see, now we have a little bit more of a slot. So I have some leeway when I adjust it. Uh, yeah, I'm not feeling any um, interaction with the can and the supports under the stick. Feels good. I did talk to him about weakening the sticks. There is a spring inside of the analog if you take it apart. I'm just not sure how much of it I can remove without you know, there's a certain point where this also needs to return to center, otherwise we're making an Atari 5200 joystick. Here's a question. Can we weaken the force of the spring inside of this analog stick? Well, firstly, we're going to have to take it apart. So I've got a metal can here. It's got these little tabs, and those tabs are what's holding it in. Take off these potentiometers, they should just pry off. Yep. Okay, that should reveal it. Come on. There we go. Got a little bit of grease in there. All right, see this white shaft in the middle? That's where the spring is. It's underneath it. Feels like I'm taking apart a clock. There we go. There's the spring. But how do we weaken it? While I'm waiting on springs, I think I could probably work on the touch sensor. I have a bunch of these laying around. This is the Atmel QT1070. Multiple inputs and outputs. You can use it as an I2C device or you can just use it as a standalone direct connection, which I only need two touch sensors. Now this is a surface mount chip because most modern stuff that you might actually want to use, it's all going to be surface mount. So I can just use one of these adapters, solder it to it, and then it'll be, uh, you know, actually workable. I'm going to use my stick vise. Hold it in place. Like so. What I like to do, just, uh, Put a little bit of solder on one of the pads. If you come across an integrated circuit that doesn't have a really obvious circle to indicate pin one, what you wanna do is look at the way the text is moving. So in this case, the text is going from left to right from that side, and that tells you pin one is to the left and below where the text starts. There should be plenty of room inside that controller to embed this little board. I guess we could have more than, I mean, I think in standalone mode, this gives us four touch buttons. And I'll just, uh, I'll just add some headers over here so I can attach my bench power supply to it. 
there's a regulator inside of the controller right there. I am just going to go out on a limb and guess it is 3.3 volts. I'm sure this chip will operate at that range. All right, well, I'm gonna wire this up based off the demonstrations in the PDF. All right, I followed the data sheet. It's pretty simple for standalone mode. You just pull pin two high, that's the mode pin, and then make sure reset is also pulled high so it doesn't go into reset, which would be if reset was low. Got these two LEDs on the outputs and then uh, 4.7K resistors on the input. So I guess the theory is I touch the end of these and these lights should light up. So these resistor leads would connect to whatever rods we put in front of the controller as he has specified here. I might actually just use like bolts because then I could like screw the bolt into the plastic, put a nut on the back of it to secure it. And then I could also use like some Sugru to really hold it in place. Still nothing. Let's hook this up to a meter. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I should have read the manual. I bet it's an open collector output, which means it needs a pull-up resistor. Otherwise, you're not going to actually see a digital transition. So an open collector, basically, it's open. And then when it's activated like this, it pulls low. So you basically need an external current source in order to see a change. So I'm going to hook up a uh, resistor put it into the negative of the LED, and then I'll connect the positive of the LED to the power source. Then we'll see if that works. That could work to our advantage because unlike the face buttons, I don't think L3, R3 are uh, pressure sensitive. They're just on or off. And then almost always what happens is you basically have the uh, sense input for a button pulled high, and then when you push the button, it goes to ground and makes it zero. So that could actually work here. I mean, we could basically just hook this directly up to the LX, LY, and it would pull to ground, simulating the button press. Yep, there you go. All right, I'm going to basically uh, simulate what it would be like in the controller. So I'm going to add a 10K pull up to the line, 10K pull up resistor. So that will make that line normally high, and it'll only go low if the touch sensor is activated. All right, let's apply voltage. Zap. All right, we're at 3.2 volts. Can't remember which one it was. Yep. So yeah, by using a pull-up resistor, the touch sensor is basically, you know, pulling it to ground, which is pretty much the exact um, function that we need to replicate the click-in tax switches on the left and right analogs. Cool, so I mean, we can attach this with very few components. We probably don't even need to use the pull-up resistor because that's already going to be present on that button. So yeah, we'll just hook up this uh, touch sensor IC in place of the left and right click-in sticks. The new springs came in. So it's like this other spring, but it's much thinner metal. Let's see if it fits in here. All right, it fits that part. I'm concerned though it won't fit around this shaft. It doesn't want to go all the way down. Okay, so the trick is how to get that thinner spring to fit around this white plate. I can't just cram it on because if I do, then a lot of the spring will be and basically locked to the shaft and it will lose its, you know, spring qualities. So you can see the difference here. <clears throat> Here's the original spring, see how far it goes on? Look at that. Now there I got it to fit, although it's not super loose. I wonder if that'll make a difference. I guess we can put this together and see if it still works. You can never have enough three-in-one oil. That could be a commercial. More rich, chocolatey three-in-one oil, please. All right, compress that in place. There was actually oil in the bottom of it, so I'll, I'll add some more. I've never actually taken one of these this far apart with the intention of putting it back together. Got the mechanism back together. It's definitely weaker than it was before, which is what Vivek wanted. Still has that issue that all modern sticks do, whereas if you go too far in one direction, it stays there. My concern is that since the spring is weaker, 
it would have more of a chance to stick over there. It would, you know, basically take more intervention for it to go back to where it needs to be. And that's very easy to move. Of course, adding the potentiometers will add a little bit of resistance. I did remove the uh, click in button. See what they do is they have a little tack switch there. And when you push in on the stick, that shaft presses it. Got the PCB mounted and the analog sticks are pretty well centered. And now they're very weak. I will need to put some Sugru around this one so it has a ring like this one. Otherwise, if you push it all the way, it will stay there. I think I'll tackle the D-pad next. He wants it to go here, but he wants it to be smaller, kind of like the close together buttons on a Nintendo Switch. I have one of these. Someone at Microsoft sent me this. Don't ask why. But, you know, there's a traditional D-pad there. I wonder if it would fit. Oh, this one's wireless. Why are there no wires connected to the internet? It's wireless. There's its rubber pad. Oh, that's in there good. It's using the same signaling style where it's got one common going to each one, which is going to be some sort of analog digital converter sensor, and then it's got a feed going to it. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically chop off this side of the board. How does this fit inside this shape? Uh, it's bigger than that circle. Hmm. Uh, it's close. I mean, it might be close enough. We could actually angle the buttons a little bit. So the buttons are close together, but they could have flanges at the bottom, which actually contact the points. I cut down some of these tabs and made some marks. I think if I slice the circuit board off here at this black line and also carve out an area there where that circle is for one of the uh, mounting posts, uh, we should be able to get this part to fit. I chopped down as little as possible, so I still have access to some of these traces here for rewiring the D-pad itself. I think it should... Yes, it does fit. Great. I'm going to cut away a little on the sides to make sure that it fits inside of that circular chamber where the analog stick used to be. It's probably hard to see with the camera, but... Uh, yes, so we have the circular uh, area here. Now the rubber fits entirely inside of it. So conveniently there's vias on the back of it for pretty much everything. Uh, the up via got chopped off so I just added this little wire here. All right, here is the D-pad and I've cut down the silicon just like in my earlier test so these buttons are easier to push. All right, here's the inside of the Hori Pad Mini. Right off the bat you can see these parts are separated once again. But what's nice is not so much that these are in one unit, because that's not the most important thing. The important thing is the rest of the controls are horizontal like this with space for the analog stick, unlike the previous uh, PCB. I know he wants this shape and size, so I'm thinking maybe we could just put this circuitry inside of here. I mean, I've done stuff like that in the past many years ago. Seems like it would... Oh yeah, I mean, we'd have to make some adapters, but I know we could use Sugru. Well, I guess the next step would be figuring out how to take the guts from the Mini Hori and getting like the D-pad and the ABXY in place. I 3D printed this little test cap. It has a smaller grouping of the buttons, which is what Vivek wanted. And it's got a little bit of a fillet on it. The idea is this should fit into this hole. Yeah, it's pretty good fit. It doesn't go in all the way. So I think what I'll do is I'll reduce the outer diameter of the lip a little bit. Let's give this a shot. Here is the button and it's got a little flange, like a little foot on the end. That's because the actual pad isn't as close as we want it to be. Also got to figure out how I'm going to assemble this for real. All right, let's snap that in. So if you look straight down on it, you can see how the silicon uh, pads underneath aren't lined up with our new smaller holes. 
but that boot shape should make up for it. So we have some slots here which will make it hold our uh, tab in place and then keep it from rotating. I think I'm going to print these a little taller. Um, so normally a button is 0.1 inch off the surface of a controller, but I want these to be a little easier to get at. And also I'm going to have the upper one be a little bit taller and the lower one be a little bit shorter. So they're kind of angled up. Okay, got a black cap printed up and a whole bunch of little uh, buttons. Okay, so the reason I printed so many of these, couple reasons. Uh, one was in case some of them aren't so good. Another thing is um, the more different things you're printing on the printer, the less dwell time there is. I wanted to make sure that the styration layers weren't too ridiculous because when it uh, changes position or speed or layer, sometimes it'll like leave a blob behind. So by printing so many of these, we basically ensure that only a few of them might have that defect. You know, I bet I'd be pretty good at that operation game now as an adult. Oh, I just ruined a femur bone. Yes, I know it's redundant. Don't email me. Eh, what's the best way to place this? I don't know. Nah, it's... I know, I'll just go for it. Oh, no. Maybe instead of trying to put these in in their final position, like this, I can put them in rotated, right? So we want to go like this. If I can remember which way they're rotated, I think I could probably rotate them using these tweezers and get them to lock into place. Why'd well, I have to go and make things so complicated? It's because I am a skater boy. <laughs> I promise to never say that again. Oh, who am I kidding? I'll say that again. Why do I do this to myself? Okay, so this is the top one. And I'm going to rotate it. Well, that would be counterclockwise from the front. So I'm going to rotate these all in the same direction. I hope that's the way he wanted the buttons. He wanted them to be small and, and switch-like. Oh boy, that was a lot like picking a lock. So what I realized was if you put it, if you hang it upside down, like this, then you can let gravity pull the, um, the buttons into place. Now that my very much like picking a lock assembly is in place, the buttons are working. I think I'm going to use some black Sugru to hold it in place and maybe also put a transition onto this lip here. Let's get this Sugru out onto a tray. Nice. I'm going to put some in this corner first so I can transition between this disc and that disc. You can remove Sugru using a, a knife. So if they need to do something with this D-pad they could Always remove it. My fingerprints are all over this. Oh, you mean it's very obviously a Ben Heckendorn design? No, I mean my fingerprints are literally all over it. In the Sugru. Hashtag correct use of word literally. I've tested this with other pieces of plastic. Sugru will stick to this shiny ABS pretty well. So we should be all right here. I also want to make sure that the Sugru does not impede the full range of the buttons. Yeah, we can use a Sugru to ease the transition on this piece of engraving plastic. Make it look a little bit more part of the controller. A little. Oh no. We're over the completely useless touchpad area. Oh, however, will we survive? I want you to sculpt me like one of your French controllers. I just had a cool idea. This knurled screw that I'm going to use for the touch sensor. 
What if you used it to give the Subaru some texture? Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's sweet. That's right, it's a texturizing rod. Well, I'm gonna do that for the rest of the project. Next, I need to think about the four action buttons. Now, this is the circuit board from the Hori Mini. And um, I, I, I kind of want to use it. So we'd have our analog sticks there. And we'd mount this just behind it. There should be enough room. So what I think I'm going to do is <clears throat> this. I'm going to carve out this plastic here. Then on the mini controller, I'm going to carve out that same area and transplant it into this slot and then attach it using Sugru then possibly extend the shafts on the buttons. And then like with the D-pad that I transplanted there, well, I'll just wire that manually between them. I've uh, scored a diamond shape with my X-Acto knife around these buttons. And now what I can do is I can cut away the inside and bend it, and that should give me a pretty good opening. I'm going to cut away the middle, that way I have a break point. Yeah, it's giving me a little bit of resistance because there's the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the circular guides on the back. Actually, if I break those off here, it'll probably increase my chances of bending the front. All right, I've got a nice diamond-shaped hole cut out. Then if you look at this, we can see that the new buttons will fit easily inside of this and they'll be closer together than the old buttons were. All right, got a trace there. So this will be easier to cut out because I'm not trying to make a hole in the controller. I'm trying to remove the buttons from the controller so I can just hit it with the Dremel on those angles. Come on. Ah, oh, man. There we go. I also marked uh, which one was the top so that the uh, buttons will insert the right way. Uh, let's see how close we got. Not too horrible. The thing that'll be nice about this is we can just take the existing buttons and uh, pop them in. I use some hot glue to fix this piece of plastic in space. Now I'm going to use Sugru to cover up the gaps and blend it as best I can. Fresh Sugru. Here I'm going to kind of use it more like a clay. I'm going to push it in. I wonder how good of a transition you could actually make with this stuff. Like how thin could you apply it and still have it be stable? Well, actually, if I spread it across the surface, I can make up for the deviations in height. See, like right there, the blue plastic is a little lower than the original controller. Hey, I can hide the fact that the plastic was blue. No one will ever know. Knurled knob to the rescue. <laughs> so cool. It's like an ASMR thing. Yeah, now that we've added our amazing texture, now we can cut out the buttons. Yeah, so let's see if I remember from Parappa the Rappa or God of War, where all the buttons are. God of War, Parappa the Rappa crossover. Zeus! I can also use some Sugru on the inside to help support it. So I'll just add it around here and a few other spots. I do need to keep this clear because that's where one of the uh, shoulder buttons is going to go. Okay, I've got a bunch of Sugru around the inside of the buttons as well to give it lots of strength. Looks like everything fits. I can probably just trim anything that doesn't fit after it dries. 
Okay, now I need to put a PCB here for the buttons. There are some conveniently located posts, and one of them actually lines up. But I don't really want to put the circuit board this far back. So what I think I might do is take another one of these mini controllers, take it apart, chop off its PCB, mount it down there. That way this PCB can be a little bit further back and I'll just hand wire everything to it. So there's some really nice, obvious labeled test pads here that we can solder to. I'm gonna cut it right there. So we still have that screw post. So we have our test pads here that we can connect to and these buttons just go to ground so we can use these test pads for the signals and then grab any of the grounds and use that for the other side of the connection. Or look, there's even a ground test pad right there. Oh, so convenient. There we go. I cut these screw posts out of the other plastic shell and I screwed them to this PCB. So I'm gonna place this here and then just shave off a little bit at a time until they're the right height. And then I'll secure this down with Sugru. Okay, the Sugru has set overnight. Let's see if we can remove the screws without the posts coming out. All right. So we've added new screw posts using existing plastic shafts and Sugru. I've added back in the rubber buttons for turbo and assign, and these are going to become share and option. Uh, on a PlayStation 4 controller, I find the option button awkward to hit, so I'm sure it's even more difficult if someone doesn't have full hand function. So yeah, I'm moving these down here. I've just added tack switches onto this board. So we have the, the uh, PlayStation button, share, option, and then touchpad click. See how the, but the tack switches will just go up to the rubber buttons, Hold them in place, and then we should get clicky action. Nice. Now I positioned the post a little loose because it's easier to add material than to remove it. All right, I've carefully cut away two sides of each one of the silicon domes so it's easier to press. So I've attached this thin wire to the um, four action buttons as well as ground. And what this will allow me to do is to bridge it over onto the actual live controller here. You may note I've added a header here that is for the USB disconnect. I just added that so we can work with this without having the USB cable hanging off of it and driving me mad. Okay, I've glued the actual driver PCB in place and now I can start wiring up the D-pad and the face buttons. All right, I've got the D-pad wired up on this side and the face button's wired up on that side. Now I can plug it into a computer and see if it still works. Let's try these buttons. All right, looks like they all work. Okay, so for the L3, R3, we're going with the touch control. I have a um, three quarter inch screw here in a threaded aluminum shaft. All right, I've made a ring with the wire and tinned it with solder to keep it in line. So let's see if we can screw this post over it. All right, I've got the uh, two touch sticks in place. I'm soldering this adapter directly to our uh, test PCB here, basically just flowing the solder through the vias so it connects directly to the pads. Yeah, so uh, we see the little regulator right there. That's no doubt where 3.3 volts is coming from, which is what we can use over here. So I'll just uh, jump a wire over there and then make the other connections. Try to figure out what's what here on this regulator. Here's five volts in, okay. So this is also gonna be duplicated on one of these pins, I, so, I assume. Yep, okay. So that's in, in. So the other one's gonna be ground or another one's gonna be ground. There's ground, which means that one right there is going to be 3.3 volts out. For the ground connection, let's scrape off some solder mask here. Happy little solder mask. A piece of lead wire from a resistor or something connected there. Now we can take that, twist it, and go over. 
this just, you know, is another way to add a little bit of rigidity to it. Gonna heat it up, push it down, let it cool. Should be good. All right, we'll take the resistor, twist it like that, twist it like that. Maybe just give it a little bit of a turn there. All right, so these are gonna be our two inputs and then our two outputs are five and six. Oh, and of course they're swapped around. So this resistor drives that output and this resistor drives that output. Of course, because why wouldn't it be backwards? Okay, so we have our Atmel touch sensor here. It's hooked up to 3.3 uh, .3 volts and ground. We have our two touch sense wires going through these resistors and the shafts, and then the result is going over to the L3, R3 inputs on the main board. Let's see if it works. All right, there's the left and the right. There is a little bit of lag of it disconnecting, but that shouldn't actually really affect anything. Okay, going to do the shoulder buttons next, but there is an issue we need to address. So here is the mini controller. Now remember, this is what we're actually using for our uh, driver guts. Notice how there are four uh, connections to the shoulder button. There's L1, which is non-analog, and L2, which is analog as opposed to what was on the Hori FPS Pro, which is PS3 compatible as well. See that? They have a common going to both of the buttons and then two separate returns. But I need this mechanically to fit into the controller, so I need to figure out a way to split this. I think I have a pretty good solution here. I cut a slit in the copper trace. So now the analog button will be these two wires, and then I'll just add a wire I checked, there should be plenty of room, so this wire shouldn't cause any mechanical interference. Okay, I tested it, and the analog button worked pretty well, but the shoulder button was stuck on, and I think the issue with that is we have the uh, analog carbon contact across it, but it's not providing enough resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my X-Acto knife and basically scrape away the middle of it to separate it, and then it should work like a normal uh, button does. Okay, I'm gonna test the resistance of it. Uh, here's a pro tip. Remove one of the connections before you test resistance on things like this, because if you don't, you'll have internal resistance in the circuitry, or rather an internal connection, and that will give you a false reading. Okay, open line. Should be good to go. All right, next I need to wire up the two main analog sticks. So here's the pattern circuit board from the original uh, mini controller. And here's what I built. Um, one of the sticks is in the same orientation. See how it's got three, 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 three. The other one isn't, so I just need to make sure that I wire it up correctly. Basically with an analog stick, it's a potentiometer, right? And you sense it in the middle, and then you have usually ground on one side and then a reference voltage on the other side. So in this case, if you push the stick up, the uh, sense pin goes closer to ground. So when I rewire it over here, see right here, this is the, uh, the vertical pot. So I want to make sure that this pin is connected to ground and this pin is connected to the reference voltage. And then, even though it's rotated, you know, 180 degrees, it will still have the same functionality as the original stick orientation. So I've got the pattern here. I just have to follow it. Okay, I've got the... LX, LY, RX, RY cables attached. I've got ground and reference voltage attached. Let's test it out. They work, but it looks like the range is not going the full distance. See that? Could also do that for the uh, right stick. Yeah, those should go completely down. Uh, here's a stock Hori controller. Well, mostly stock. And as you can see, you easily get the full range. I pulled the analog caps off so I could just test the uh, stick range. And uh, it definitely can go the full distance without the caps on it. So that tells me it's a mechanical issue, not an electrical issue. Got these 3D printed shafts. So the idea is, you know, these can be removable. So I'll, uh, I'll print and sculpt extra that I can send along. 
And I changed the shape a little bit, so we've got kind of a X there. And I will build up the Sugru. I'll have a little nub on the upper left of the left stick, which is what he wanted. So I need to build up from the sides end up. I can't really go underneath at all. But it is moldable glue, so hopefully it will stick to the surface. Oh, I should probably wash these surfaces to make sure they're as clean as possible. Hey, I found some orange Sugru. I think that's what he wanted in the first place. Sticking to the uh, inside groove that I made, that's good. And that's why I put extra features on this instead of just having a plastic disc. I wanted there to be more, you know, surface area that the Sugru could stick to. So I want to get this to the side of the plastic piece, but no further than that because I don't want it to. Uh, collide to the edge of the plastic controller. So I'll just use a knife and make sure I've got it level. I want to have a bit of an indent, but every time I try to press it with my finger, the Sugru sticks to my finger and pulls up. I'm going to try licking my finger. Uh, yeah, sure enough. It gives me a little bit of a barrier. Now I can use that to shape the Sugru without it being pulled back up by my finger. There's probably water in the Sugru as is. And it kind of smooshed over the sides more than I would like, but these plastic shafts are removable. So once it's cured, I can just lift it up and then carve off the bottom. Gonna lick this X-Acto knife. Yeah, and use it to make a nice center point. I also need to add the little nub that he wants on the upper left side of the left hand stick. All right, let's add the little upper left hand nub thing. Scored the surface so we have something to grab onto. What was that class I took in middle school? I guess it was art class. <laughs> and, uh,. Yeah, well, when you're attaching clay to clay, you know, you need to score it so there's like surface area so it can stick. That's right. Free knurling. A fine jewelry craftspeople create the exquisite ring for your special day. I mean, I guess I can just make a whole bunch of these caps and send them all along and see which one he likes the best. I'm actually going to carve out a little bit of that bump. So I think there should be a decent circular area in the middle still. I don't want the bump to affect it too much. All right, I made two more designs. A slight variation on the ones before. so. I'll just keep doing this until I run out of orange Sugru. Gonna let them cure over here on these screws. Hopefully gravity doesn't affect them too much. Time to work on the stand. All right, I 3D printed some parts. Here is a base. I can use these holes to screw it to whatever the main base is, probably a piece of uh, thin plywood with uh, gel foam on it. And this is the riser shaft. It has a groove in the back for a set screw. Let's go in just like that. Then I have a one quarter inch uh, socket cap screw here. So what we can do is we can take this nut, put it into that slot. Oh, come on. Eh, I think our hole might need to be slightly bigger. <laughs> Can you hear that? You hear all the threads are actually kind of touching the plastic. So when you're doing something like this, we're using a set screw to set the depth of 
something else. You can't have anything else restricted or threaded. Otherwise, it won't work. So I'm going to go to my drill bit set. Get one size above one quarter. Oh, don't worry, international viewers. I have imperial and metric drill bits. There we go. See how it goes through nicely now? There we go. So now you have this. So he'll be able to lock it in whatever height position he wants. <laughs> this cap screw is probably unnecessarily long, but oh well. Now up here, I have another pivot. So we can tilt the controller. See that? And then I've got a lock nut, which is a nut with a nylon insert. And that will keep it in place. It's just like assembling IKEA furniture. You know what? I have never been to an IKEA. That is my confession. Not that I have any guilt over it. I attached the plate with screws. I'll put nuts on the inside to hold it in place. Yeah, so the idea is, you know, his his the ball of his hand can rest on the mat, so he doesn't actually have to lift the controller, he just kind of holds it in place. So for me, maybe a little lower. Now Vivek wants some 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks placed in the controller. These can be used for external switches. It's kind of the standard way of them doing it. Um, I'm trying to figure out where to put them. I thought about putting them both under here. However, if you're holding the controller, your hands might hit them. So maybe I should put like just one down here and then one on this side. Like if you're holding the controller like this, if something was sticking out there that shouldn't, shouldn't get in the way. This DeVault battery is getting old. <laughs> It belongs in a museum. So do you. All right, uh, so on this side, obviously, I can just wire it up directly to where it needs to go. Then for the back side, since there's no other electronics in it, I'll probably have just like a header disconnect so you can split the controllers if need be. Okay, I got the headphone jacks wired up and I put the retaining rings in place. They should hold pretty well. Now I will add these to the back of the controller as well. So Vivek wants a uh, triangle, circle, and then down here we'll have R1 and R2. That way he'll have as many options as possible for using this controller. All right, I have L1, R1, and a common ground hooked up. Going to this header here so I can detach the halves of the unit. So I'll just attach a matching header on the inside of this, and then that should do it for all of the internal signals. All right, let's mark the polarity of this wire that we use to connect the halves together. Kind of worried about this USB cable. It needs a strain relief, but I'm not exactly sure where to fit one because there's so much stuff in this controller already. It's kind of tricky to squeeze it together. You got to get the shoulder buttons lined up. I did make a few more changes to this. The plastic disc here actually uh, recut that on the laser with a slightly eccentric hole, meaning the hole is not centered. That way I can make sure I had full range of motion with the stick. I also reprinted the left stick a little taller than the right one, just to make sure we get the motion we need. So even though I made a whole bunch of random caps for both of the sticks, I need to make some new caps now because I now have a taller stick over here. But at least now there's options. Although I ran out of orange Sugru, so I'm gonna go with uh, this light green. Sugru ASMR. It's kind of like split pea soup color. Insert exorcist joke here. I'm not using spit this time, I have my 
NASA shot glass with just regular water in it. There must be some oil in this too. Look at how much the water beats up. I cut out this base out of six millimeter Sintra, which is an expanded PVC foam on my CNC machine. I didn't have exactly the right size bit for the size four screws, so I just drilled uh, 16 inch screws and I'll just drill them out with a slightly larger bit and then they should fit the screws we need. So your hands will go here, right? So they can put gel pads or whatever they want there for support. I will just attach this and then we'll have a really nice sturdy foundation for this controller. This is about the size of a microwave dinner, so I would assume it would fit on a standard tray. All right, so we have our nice base here. Let's put the controller in place. That feels good. Nice, so I'm not actually holding the controller. The controller's just being held in space at the same angle as my hands. Wow, it looks like a museum piece complete with cool stand. But of course, that stand is there for a reason. Well, um, looks like it's pretty much done. I think we can send this off to Vivek and uh, see if it helps him play video games. Click the links below in the video description to see Vivek using my controller over on the Sugru website.